Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome to another week of truth, of perspective with Mr. Roy Richmond. And I'm gathered here in the living room with a group of beautiful people. And I just want to welcome everyone that is online with us that comes here week after week to hear a new perspective and to hear truth and to get the wisdom and the word of God from someone who is dedicated to studying it from a perspective of truth. So I want to say thank you, and I'm just going to pray us in and call in this beautiful energy that we all know is present, but let's get in touch with it right now. Just closing your eyes and taking a deep breath in, just coming centered, coming to this right now moment, recognizing right now that our power lies in this present moment this moment where God is always with us, ever present. And I recognize this power right now, this one source, this divine intelligence that we call God, that we call love, that we call energy, that we call source, that we call Father, this intelligence that has many, many names. And I recognize right now that each and every one of us are a fractal of this divine intelligence, of this presence. And right now in this recognition, I identify as one, one with each and every one of you, one with our creator, one with our source, one with our father. And so right now I declare today a divine day. I declare this moment, our time together protected and anointed. I declare right now that each and every person that is watching, that their hearts may be open, that their ears may be open, that their eyes may be open to see and to witness and to feel the truths that are being spoken to them today. I declare that each and every one of these people have a blessed day, that they open up to receive the truth of their being, that prosperity is your abundance is your birthright, that prosperity is your birthright, that perfect health is your birthright, to experience love in this lifetime is your birthright. I know these things to be true. So I ask right now that each and every one of you just open up to receive that. I release these words right now with so much gratitude, this humble gratitude that I get to live this life, that I get to be a comforter in this life, that I get to be a walking, breathing, living example of who and what God is. I say thank you for that. Thank you for each and every one of these people that gather with us week after week. May you be blessed today and each and every day. And together with so much gratitude, we say, and so it is. Yes. Yes. Thank you. you. That reminded me when I went went to Full Gospel Assembly, Pastor Hibbard, for quite a few years, had me get up and pray before his meeting and I always felt very honored in doing that so I appreciate that also we want to remember Norma is going to be having knee replacement Thursday yeah. Wednesday this Wednesday and so we're going to lay hands on her after I get done we were going to do it before but we forgot but <laughs> she's going to have it done and she's got a great doctor that knows what he's doing he's worked on me and so we believe that father's power is working through him and going to bring her to a perfect recovery from that. So we appreciate all of you being on here with us today. It's an honor to be able to serve you the what I used to call the bread and wine. And that's what it is. It's the bread and wine of the word. And uh, there's a lot of people out there reaching out to us on Facebook and letting us know they're watching and, you know, texting us, texting Allison and Mallory. And it's just an honor to be able to serve people and, and teach them these truths that we've discovered. And there's so much more to be discovered. I used to tell people, if I found the mother of all gold mines, would you want me to share it with you? <laughs> you would. And so that's, that's what we do when we discover the word. And it is, it is like a massive gold mine of wealth. And it's a wealth that, you know, money won't really change your life for the good because it can go away overnight. But when you hear truth, and you hear the truth about who you are and truth that you are spirit and everything we're teaching, it really makes it for a better life. And it helps you fulfill your purpose in life. So <clears throat> two weeks ago, we finished up on the most powerful chapter in the Bible, chapter eight. And I hope you guys enjoyed that. I'm gonna publish an entire book just on those lessons. So I'm waiting for Carol to do her final edit and then we'll get it published. 
But now we're going to start on chapter 9 of Romans. So you guys here have your notes, and we'll go through that. As I was reading these verses, what stuck out to me is that the word we breathe out of our mouths must come from what we hear Father say. And I wish I would have learned that a long time ago. <laughs> you know, I studied under John Cahill many times when I was learning the redemptive view. And he always talked about put a guard over my mouth, guard over my ear, guard over my eyes, what I see. But we really do need a guard over our mouth because our mouth is the part of our senses that repeats what we believe, repeats what we hear. You know, and sometimes we can say things that it's really not what we believe, but it's still, we've heard it somebody else say it, like, oh my gosh, it's gonna be 110 degrees today, or it's gonna feel like 110. If you're not careful, you're gonna die. <laughs> you know, I was telling somebody the other day, well, when I was a kid, we heard it was 110, we went out and played. You know, we didn't have all that fear, so we want our mouths to be protected and we need to know what Father said. So we're going to start with Romans 9.1 uh, in my translation. Paul said, uh, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience is also bearing witness in the Holy Ghost or in spirit. So Romans 9.1, the words I speak, if you would, originate from, this is my translation, the words I speak originate from contact with the divine mind, Jesus and the Essenes. They are the truth and are not meant to deceive. When I heard and continue to hear, what I heard and continue to hear has borne witness in my conscience by the voice of holy breath. So he was saying, Donna asked me what I mean by conscious. His conscience is clear. He knows that he's speaking truth. Why would he know that? Because it affected him. It changed his life. So he said, I speak the truth from my contact with Father and Jesus. I am not lying. My consciousness, my conscience confirms it through Holy Spirit. And that is so powerful because I can't tell you how many times I've been accused of being a liar or a hypocrite or whatever the words that go because people, it just goes against what they believe. They believe something all their life. And I always say a lie believed to be a truth will affect you though it is a truth. And so I was talking to a gentleman the other day and sharing some truth with him. And, it was very difficult for him. And I said, I understand. It's like me telling you one plus one is three. You'd think I was crazy. And he said, yeah, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> you know, so, and I understand that. But Romans 9, 1 opens the door to a spiritual understanding of our subjectively being spirit, slow down to visibility, and our connection with Father. Subjectively means it's personal. You know, I've heard preachers talk about things that we can be or should be, but it wasn't subjectively true. It was objectively true, but not subjectively. Subjectively, when it's personal and you experience it and you know that you are spirit and you know without a shadow of doubt that you have contact with Father all the time, that Father's not out there somewhere. Because I used to pray to a far out somewhere God, you know, or on a, on a planet called heaven or whatever, and I'm down here. <clears throat> so in this passage here, the apostle emphasized this, the genuineness and the sincerity of this Logos word that we speak of, highlighting that he speaks the truth rooted in this connection. And so the emphasis on truth as a guide uh, from the voice of spirit sets the stage for us contemplating the metaphysical significance hidden within these words. Because when we just read a surface level, it matters not who you are or how great the preacher was, whether it's Billy Graham or whoever it was, they had to have some question as they read the Bible, does, is this really God? Is this really love? Because actually the written word has less love, right? Than the metaphysical, the spiritual word. Because you read it and it's just, he loves me, he loves me not all the time. And so if there's one book in the Bible that I can't get enough of, it's Romans. And the book of Romans has changed my life. Uh, it did it when Brother Garner taught it. I also I wrote a long thesis on Romans several years ago, and that's what I used to get my doctor's degree, 48 chapters of it. But I was apprehended by it. And I was thinking about this this morning. I believe the two most important characters in the entire Bible besides Father is Jesus and Paul because they function totally as comforter messengers. Uh, there were some in the 
what you would call Old Testament times, Old Outlook times, Isaiah, all of them, but they never were, were allowed to kind of move, move into their own, into truth, because they were still affected by the Mosaic Law. And of course, we don't know a lot of people in the Middle East too, and I'm sure there were a lot of them, but I'm talking about in the Bible. Those are the two greatest messengers that we should be listening to. So thus, I translated and interpreted it several years ago, and I continue to teach from that book metaphorically and metaphysically. So metaphysically, meaning other than physical, we can interpret the verse, uh, verse 11, as, if you would, as an imitation to explore the power of inner knowing, an invitation to manifest truth within, because we are the manifestation of the very truth of God, but it's gotta be in, inside of us, we're at in our conscious awareness, in our subconscious. Now, sometimes we can be conscious of something, but our subconscious is where our sin is, right? And Paul said, when I would do good, I would do bad, and he said the reason why is because there's sin in my members. And what he meant by that is he still had a religious, uh, a religious mindset, if you would, in his subconscious. He still had the memories of all that. I mean, can you imagine being a doctor today of some kind of unbelievable uh, ability to do something, and all of a sudden something new comes on, and you can't let go of that? Yeah, but this, this is the way you do it. This, this is the way you treat that person. Well, no, we have a better. All you've got to do is give them one pill, not 50 pills, <laughs> you know, if you would. So it would be difficult. So by recognizing and acknowledging the presence of our renewed consciousness or the divine wisdom and knowledge and understanding, we realize that there's life within inside of us. And then there is this wellspring of wisdom and truth and it's beyond the surface level understanding. So we can speak the truth because only one comes from the voice of our Father, and that's what we want. Everything we hear needs to come from the voice of Father. What I say, you need to question it. You need to say, is this Father? Is this something Father would say? And so Father spoke to Isaiah to tell the people to stop listening to the paganistic and the mythological, mythological teachers and their mindset. And that's when he said, see she from man whose breath is in his nostrils. In other words, quit listening to man who gets all of his information from the sensory realm, or sensual. And by the way, sensual doesn't mean sexual. Sensual means material. It's, a, it's the sense realm. You know, it's what we go to to get pleasure in the material world. And of course, we are slammed by the material world, are we not? new cars, new houses, new this, it's always thrown at us. And this will make you happy if you buy this new car. Well, I don't know how big the percentage is, but a lot of percentage of people buy a new car at least every two years. So that car that they just had to have doesn't make them happy anymore because this new car has a better gadget, right? Whatever it is. And same thing with understandings. There's, there's all kinds of new, new teachings that come along and they sound better and they better and better. And that's why I tell people, if you're searching nonstop for somebody to teach you something, you need to find one or two teachers that are teaching truth and pretty much stick with that because there's all kinds of stuff that will sound good that will lead you astray and you have to be careful with that. So therein is why there are so many voices speaking conflicting words that do not conform to the not concealed word of God. Does that fan need to be turned off? Is that bothering anybody? Okay. So most of the teachings from the past and still are, they're from the surface level of, of, uh, of the Word of God. And they're also from a surface level of the redemptive view, which sounds good. And, you know, it brought me to a certain place. But after a while, it still didn't satisfy me because I knew it had, it had to be more about Father and not about Jesus. And religion makes it more about Jesus. They point you to the messenger. So those who were teaching did not bring anyone to what I would say spirit awareness. And yet Father made us spirit. Father formed us in our womb and our mother's egg formed to be spirit. Of course, slowed down visibility. So sadly, most of the people who teach the Bible, they continue to keep, teach what their forefathers thought. And it's just on and on and on. My mom passed me down all my dad's Bibles and books and stuff. And, you know, I, when did dad die? 19, I forget when it was. 94. But 
94. Yeah. So within a couple of years, I met Brother Garner. I realized that I can't teach any of that anymore. Because what outer court is, outer court is always trying to please God on a daily basis. They had sacrifices yearly. They had sacrifices nonstop. You know, if you did this, if you did that, if you touched somebody dead, it was always trying to please God. And then when you get to that uh, holy place, which we call the redemptive view, uh, that's when you realize that you don't have to go get saved over and over and over again. And I even taught that you don't have to ask God to forgive you over and over and over again because God never held anything against you. And that was a little tough for some people. But Paul struggled with mixing his years of being learned, a learned man in the Mosaic Law and again being tempted to add the law, the law to what Jesus and the scenes taught him. So again, we've heard this, that Father told him, hey, start drawing from your divine mind. So again, how can you say what Father says? Well, how can you say what I say? You can spend time with me, right? You can listen to me. You can converse with me. And that's how you can begin to say what Father says. And I'm doing my best to practice this within the medical industry. When they say this, I want to hear Father say, I say this. And you can find that in a lot of Paul's writings and even Jesus. He would say, they say this, the Pharisees, but I say this. So we need to start, we should start thinking when we hear a voice, is it they or is it Father? And then if you recognize that it's they say this, then I say, well, I say this. I read your post, Mallory, the other day about this lady that, loved you and cared for you, and she ran into one of your past friends 10 years ago, and that lady said a lot of bad stuff. And I, I almost cried for you, that was terrible. Because it happens, it happens to a lot of people. But I like how you answered it. Yeah, what she said was true back then, not today, you know. And so what, what we said, what, the, what they said yesterday was true in their perception. It was true in their understanding, but it's not the truthful word. It's, and that's how we can help people ourselves. Yes. So in the King James Version, the phrase, my conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit, points toward this importance of deep contemplation and attuning to the divine mind. And that's your answer you asked me, Donna, what he meant by conscience. It's, it's, we, we've, we begin to realize who we are yes. and what we have. Yes. And I know it's true. Amen. I know without a shadow of a doubt that I'm a son of God. Mm -hmm. I know without a shadow of a doubt that I have all things that pertain to physical life and spiritual life. I know that. And so when we listen to the whispers of the voice of the Spirit and the thoughts, we connect to, to divine spirit and, and that dwells within us as, we, uh, as who we are, but also it guides us. So we are spirit, but spirit guides us. And I like the first time I heard Kay said this, spirit said to me, you know, I, and I say that now. I don't say God said to me or Father said to me because it is Father. But literally, Spirit speaks to us. I am Spirit. And that's why we say the voice sounds just like you because it is you. <laughs> when you tune in to the Father, then you say what the Father would say. Right? And you can boldly get up like I believe Mallory does. She knows when she speaks, she's speaking as the voice of one. She's not just speaking as some fleshly young woman. She's speaking as a daughter of God, and a powerful daughter of God. So this knowing is important for us. So this metaphysical understanding invites us to explore beyond the literal interpretation of the text and deeply explore, explore our spiritual being in the Word to where we can see and who was the greatest example of Jesus and, and that we have. And there are other books that I'm studying where there are the other messengers out there that exemplified living as spirit and literally lived supernaturally, which means other than physically. They, they were visible, but they didn't live with the limitations of just being physical. And that's where most of us have been all of our life. We've just seen, you know, we sang the song, I'm just a human, you know, and we blamed it. Well, you know, what do you expect? I'm, I'm a sinner. You know, even if I'm a sinner saved by grace, I justified why I did all that stuff because I really wasn't taught who I really am. And so what happens, this unlocks its potential to align with truth, 
where we can walk a path of authenticity, I can't even say it this morning, authenticity and integrity. Because I want to walk with all integrity. I want people to come to me and say, I can trust this man. Because I've been in places where you thought you could trust the pastor or the teacher and you couldn't. And so I want people to see that in me. So as Paul says, so do we speak the truth by staying in contact with Father. And I wrote in our last chapter uh, that I taught, Jesus stayed near Father's voice and never, ever left. And that, that's, that's a powerful thing. He never left Father. And so John the Apostle pictures the way by staying near Jesus, even laying his head on his chest, which is literally laying his uh, his heart or his uh, laying his awareness on Jesus's heart awareness, if you would. And he always listened to Jesus. It was a picture of that. And so ultimately, Romans 9, 1 teaches that we possess an innate connection to our Father, to our source of all truth through our divine consciousness. And by cultivating a deep sense of self-awareness and opening our heart awareness to guiding that guiding presence of spirit, we gain access to the inner reservoir of wisdom and understanding. So it's literally something that we need to practice every day. Almost like a moment by moment, we need to silently be aware, whether when you're going through your work, whatever you're doing, when you're driving down the road, just realize that you have a reservoir of wisdom and knowledge that's flowing through you. And then with that wisdom and that knowledge uh, illuminates your journey towards spiritual growth and, uh, and, and self-realization. But it also takes you on divine appointments, <laughs> right? How many have ever had a divine appointment? It's awesome. Some people don't think they have, but they have. Mm -hmm. so, but sometimes we don't meet it. <laughs> but you can have a divine appointment at 7-Eleven, at Walmart, wherever you go, <laughs> there are people that are praying to God for help. Yes. They're praying for answers. And I believe spirit can lead you right into that person's presence where either you or that person says something that opens the door. Yeah. I've had many times, and I've told Donna, I said, I can't tell you what started it. But I met a person and all of a sudden I answered all the questions. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I don't even remember what they said or I said that opened the door, right. but spirit did it. So even though we have comforter messengers and other guides in our lives, it's the utmost important to listen to the voice of spirit in our ways, everything we do. Stop and think before you open your mouth. And that, that's one of the best <laughs> things we could ever think of. Donna has to do that all the time. <laughs> I have to do it all the time, but we're one. So Romans 9, 2, I often experience grief and sorrow for my fellow brothers who are stuck in the mindful thinking of the Mosaic Law. Did y'all read my post yesterday about being stuck? I, I grieve over that minister that, that he, back years ago, he told me the problem with the church is she's, her, her ears are shut. And then as we grew and grew and grew, his ears stayed shut. And I hate it because I would love to give him all that I have. So I often experience grief and sorrow for my fellow brothers who are stuck in the mindful thinking of the Mosaic Law. Verse 3, if, I would be, if it would be possible and would help, I would excommunicate myself from, the living, from living as holy breath and living eternally one with our Father to help my law-minded brothers. They are my kinsmen, according to our spirit being one, and my past dependency on the Mosaic Law. That's, that's a lot of love right there. He knew it wasn't possible, though. But he said if it would, that he could help them. So Paul's statement of his kinship with his brethren stuck, uh, stuck in the Mosaic Law was not about race or Jew or friendship, but they were also spirit. They were a kinship, and that's, that's being one. And I like it when I, I saw that the word redeem and redemption actually means kinship. And that's powerful. Father never had to redeem us because we were always his kinship. The only thing that needed to be redeemed is our awareness, if you would. So, as Dr. K points out in her teachings, we are of our father rather than of our parents. Did y'all hear me say that last week? And I like that. I'm not Allison's father. God is Allison's father. I'm her parent. That, that's, that's pretty strong. But it, but it is true because you only have one source. 
I personally am not your source of life. Although I impregnated your mother and she brought you into being, but God is your source of life. Because too often we even depend on our parents to take care of us. And we don't know that Father is our source. So Jesus said, call no man Father because our source is our only Father. And so Spirit is Father and Spirit is always active inside of us. And then we get to Romans 9, 2 through 3. It invites us to contemplate the depth of our emotions, the, 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 the necessity of empathy. I used to teach this when I sold prearranged funerals. I told people, you don't owe these people sympathy, but you do owe them empathy, yeah. right? Yeah. Because sympathy sometimes we will, like when we prearrange funeral and they said we can't afford it or we, you know, well, if I gave them sympathy, I'll walk out and they'd never be protected. But if I gave them empathy and they understand that I'm there to help them and, you know, and guide you down the, the path of doing what needs to be done, I was much more successful doing that. But I had a lot of people that felt sorry for them and they never made sales. The first objection that would come up, well, I understand, you know, but I, I don't want to have sympathy uh, when I meet somebody that's all caught up in religion. I want to have empathy for them. They can see that and then I can help them. So it reminds us of our interconnectedness as spirit beings and challenges us to extend our compassion beyond personal boundaries for the sake of world kinship. Yeah. We really need to do that. We really need to be seeing people. We had a tragedy happen in our neighborhood last week, uh, Wednesday, I guess it was. Two-year-old baby drowned mm -hmm. in a pool and it was terrible. And I talked to the board and I, I said, and, and the vice president agreed with me, we are a community here, so we need to have empathy for these people. So we gave them money and we helped them and we forgave them of a large amount that they owed us for their their dues. But it, it, it just, they couldn't believe it. They were just, I can't believe you're doing this because people don't do stuff like that. People really don't help people. And we need to realize when we're out in this world, everybody we see is our kinship. They're all our brothers and sisters. That's why I can say when somebody's done something horrible and they're going to prison for it, I can say they're still my brother. They're still a son of God, right? That's empathy. And so being a spirit being is the moving force in the world. And that's the point whence action takes place, the ecclesia, right? And so we are the creative spiritual activity that reveals the law of the spirit of abundant life. We are wall-to-wall -wall breath of life. Yes. We possess creative intelligence. We create all knowledge, all life. There's nothing you can't do that needs to be done, that you can't draw that knowledge and understanding from within inside. Have you, any of you ever experienced that before where there was just something happened and you just have, there's no way in your physical thoughts that you can do that. And then you heard, ask me, or you just tapped in, and all of a, you saw, all of a sudden you saw everything you needed to do. That, that's because it's in you already. And I've told the story about me and the four-wheeler, so I won't tell it again. But anybody that knows me knows I am not a mechanic. But Spirit took over and showed me how to fix that, that bicycle. And so uh, Paul knew his kinship was also spirit being, but they were stuck in the Mosaic Law which we have a lot of friends who are, and it's way, uh, it's way of doing things. They never saw themselves as any more than mere men struggling with failures, struggling with due-to-be laws, and that's why people can easily say, I'm still a sinner, because they never can do it. They never can give enough money, right? They never can serve enough. They never can stop things because when you try to stop something, what are you doing? You're giving it a power, right? correct? And when you say, literally when you say somebody really hurt me, you're giving it a power. And that's, that's a big thing because people do hurt us, but we can get to the place where we can just say, no weapon formed against me can prosper. No word formed against me can prosper. No thought formed against me can prosper. I know who I am. That's when you go through life and nothing affects you at all, right? 
Now, I'm not saying that affects you in the way that that baby died or whatever, but nothing affects you when, some, uh, when an attack comes against you because you know who you are. And, and you know, like I, I told my pastor once, he said, I've never seen you as a minister. You need to go back and furnish your business. And I just said, you didn't call me. So it really doesn't matter how you, what you think. So therefore, Paul grieved for them, just like we do kinship in our world. And we're all inter interconnected uh, beings, uh, being spirit, not biologically genealogy, but by father genealogy. So literally, we are not African, American, Spanish, Japanese. We're, we're one, right? There's only one race. It's just sons and daughters of God. So speaking of the Pharisees and Sadducees, Romans 9, 4. They were descendants of Israel to whom the idea of sonship was revealed. Also, it was through them came the not needed sacrificial offerings of the Mosaic Covenant continued and including following the laws of Moses, the ceremony worship, the continued offering of appeasement and all their due to be pledges. Verse 5. They were the fathers of such beliefs and the due to be works, all traducing works. I'm telling you, every law that you're told you have to do is a traducing work. I say things that we must do for ourselves, not to please God, mm -hmm. right? If I tell you you have to do something to please God, that's a traducing <coughs> work. That is a devil to you. So it was to, to them whom Jesus first appeared to announce the good news, saying, all people possess holy breath of our Father, all people are eternally sacred, holy, blessed, world without end, amen. That's the final word. All means all. I looked it up in the Greek once and it says all. I looked it up in the Hebrew and it says all. <laughs> so I defy you to leave anything out of that. Verse 6. It was not as though what they did and what they offered made the living word of Father lose its power. Every nation, race, and creed are spiritual Israel, including the physically born Jews. Jews. We are all born of Father, all born from that which is holy breath. There is no race but one. The words I speak originate from, Donna, remind me to get rid of that number one there, if you would. The words I speak originate from contact with the divine mind, Jesus, and the Essenes. They are the truth and are not meant to deceive. What I heard and continue to hear has borne witness in my conscience by the voice of holy breath. Get rid of that too, those numbers, I don't know why they're there. The grief and sorrow which I offered and experienced is for my fellow brothers who are stuck. Oh, I know what it is. I copied that again. <laughs> I've got that in there twice. Okay, I'll stop. I won't read that. Uh, did I did I read verse four? Yes. Oh. Huh? Yeah, you stopped it. All born from that which is holy breath. There is no race but one. And then that's where it switched right. over to the title Israel. All right. All right. I'll remove some of that in here. All right. So the title Israel means contending for God, or striving for God who prevails with God, a prince with God, dominion with God, and rulership with God. That's literally who they were. So the idea is a development out of contending with prevailing over anything else. So they were to develop, or the, they were to move away from all that religious stuff and all those rules and all those regulations. The title Israel in its highest sign significance symbolized spiritual consciousness. And the thoughts that function in truth and righteousness make spiritual divine mind empowering our spiritual consciousness. So literally, we are spiritual Israel. who we are today. So Israel, a prince of God, is the real man and woman, that consciousness which is founded in Father. And it requires, if you would, the story of Israel from Abraham to Jesus to picture that growth of the whole man. And I've got books that I've got written on that where you can see a growth process going on all the way from Abraham Israel and then to Jesus. So the unfoldment and lifting into this conscious includes the body of man, which is spirit slowed down to visibility. So literally, if we would realize that, then I, I believe that if I can come to this realization that my body is spirit, then everything that's called diseased has to leave. Amen. And that's why I'm speaking to these amyloids and Everything that I may not even know is called, I'm, I'm saying you are uncomfortable here because I am spirit. Yes. I'm not like a dead piece of meat that a maggot would go to. And that's why I see these amyloids and all that stuff. They don't belong to me because I'm alive. And my, my, 
my heart has a life in it and my liver has life in it and there's no place in there for you to feed off from. That, that's how I'm doing it. So the unfoldment and lifting into full spiritual consciousness includes the body of man again. And uh, there's a manifest actual spiritual substance in our life. And if you could see with God's microscope, microscope you would see spiritual activity inside of you. And sometimes I think what people, these scientists are seeing with all these new gamma ray and x-rays and, and seeing activity in the cell, I think they're seeing spirit. I really do. And so we're, we are objectively now the perfect expression of God-likeness right now. There's nothing else you need to do to express God-likeness. That's why I say to people that's got their heads down, lift your head up. Yes. You're holy. Yes. You're beautiful. You have an you individual calling in your life on this earth. And your world will not be satisfied until you be who you be. Mm -hmm. Right? So faith and Father's faith is the foundation faculty or power from the divine mind through which a spiritual man is brought forth in, again in our daily affairs. So if you read about Abraham from whom the children of Israel are descended, you see at once that he typifies faith. And I used to think that was funny in Hebrews, it says he was the father of faith, and yet he doubted, right? And Sarah came up with a good idea, and so he went and had an affair with her, her handmaiden, so, and he was an old man, so he thought, well, that's a good idea, <laughs> you know? But, but God doesn't see all that. He, he, God sees the faith, and Abraham had faith in God. So faith and father's faith is the foundation faculty or power of the divine mind, which is the spiritual man. And so if you, uh, if you, if you understand that, then we can look here in verse 7. It says, we can see Israel's identity as children of father is not based on their lineage as the seed of Abraham, but their lineage and all people's lineage is in holy breath. Isaac, the promised seed, was a symbolic picture of holy breath as Jesus was promised a comforter messenger. As Jesus is in his mission and ministry, so are we. We are all called the many-membered man. That's who we are. Individually and corporately, sons and daughters of Father. Verse 8, a better way of saying this is, those who are mindful of the Mosaic Law and all the do-to-be dead works will not subjectively experience their actual reality as being sons and daughters of Father. But those who put their confidence in what Jesus revealed in his teaching time will take an inventory and include that they and everyone else are the seed of Father. As Father is holy breath, so are we. So again, if you don't know who you be, you won't live out of who you be. Amen? Amen. So the reason I use the term comforter messenger when referring to Jesus rather than Messiah is the English title Messiah is only used two times in the King James Version. Can you believe that? You hear Messiah all the time. I called Butch, I said, how many times do you think Messiah is written? K, oh, lots of places. No, nope, only two times. And it's the English title, it's only used that many times, and it's found in Daniel 9, 25 through 26, and it's the Hebrew word is Mashka, M-A-S-H-I-Y-A-C-H, and it means anointed, and it means consecrated. So literally, folks, you are the Messiah, you're anointed, Messiah. You are anointed. And what does it mean to be consecrated? What do you have to do to be consecrated? Set apart. Well, you say set apart. Well, what has to happen? You have to see something, right? Mm -hmm. Have we not seen something? We've seen, seen tremendous truth. So the world is waiting for a Messiah to come back and kill all the bad people and make this world wonderful, not knowing that their Messiahs are right here, right now, all over the place. So to be consecrated is to have a particular truth, if you would. Also, allegorically, the word mischub, being a consecrated one, is to have one's awareness consecrated with the Logos, with the living word. So that's what we're doing. We're having ourselves consecrated. We're having our conscious awareness and our subconscious, our heart awareness. What do we want to say? We're having it consecrated, and, it's, it's been, and then it's been set apart. And set apart means kept away from religiosity yes. and that's what 
uh, Mary was told to do with Jesus, set him apart. Don't take him to church. <laughs> if they're not teaching the truth. What did we do? We grew up in church. We had children and we stuck them in Sunday school class. And Sunday school and we had no idea what those people were teaching them. We sent them to youth groups and had no idea what they were teaching them overall. So Jesus never did anything that he did not see his father do or say anything that he did not hear father say. Therefore, Jesus was not a Messiah in the sense of being a savior because father God was our savior. Yes. He saved us from the foundation of the world. How? He made us in his image. He didn't make us as dirty, rotten little sinners. He didn't make us, you know, somebody that needed to please him all the time. He made us one with him. You know, it's kind of like I used, to, I used to use an example with Donna. When we got married, I saved her. <laughs> but she was going through some tough times. She had lost. <laughs> I'm not making a joke. But she, she was struggling. She had lost a brother, lost a sitter, sister. She needed somebody to love her. And I fell in love with her and she fell in love with me. She saved me too because I needed to get out of a situation. But that's what we need to do. We need to be the ones that's going saving people rescuing them, helping them from their lifestyle. And I love what your ministry is, Mallory, with women. You know, some people would look at that and think, oh my gosh, that's terrible. But it's not because you're waking them up to identify with who they are. And then through that, you can feed them spiritual food too. And as I admire you for what you're doing. So, um, jump ahead a little bit here. So even in your personal life, Again, Jesus is not your Messiah. That's a strong again, statement. That even, <laughs> even in your personal life, Jesus is not your Messiah. Jesus is not coming to rescue you. Jesus is not answering your prayers. Jesus is not praying to God or praying to Mary to get Mary to pray to God. Father God is your source. Yeah. And Father God provided for you from the foundation of the world. So I know that will get some stone thrown, but it's the truth. So he's not returning to do anything. He's still here. Yeah. Just like this great cloud of witnesses. Ali, I saved a picture on my computer I need to send you. But it has these two young women walking along. And you can barely see Jesus in front. And you can see four or five other people walking with them and it says the job of the great cloud of witnesses. Mm -hmm. They're around here encouraging us. And sometimes they'll become visible to you if you need that. Yeah. And so uh, Jesus was a pillar of the Logos. He was a pillar of the Logos. He understood the Logos. And he, he couldn't teach them because they were so bankrupt they wouldn't listen. They were sick. They were abused they had all kinds of diseases they were they were been beaten and abused by the roman empire and so all we could do is speak to them through parables and just meet their temporal needs but again he equipped paul to do the explaining and paul did a great job and john both and then other ministers after that so i want to be a pillar of the logos don't you i, I want to i want to i want to spiritually glow with light and so that's what Jesus did. He, his light was that he glowed on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was showing his energy. He was showing his glory. He was showing his understanding. When you meet people that have great understanding, you can see it. You can say, I, I, I don't know what, I, but I just see it. I can sense it. And so on the high mountain, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. And that word transform actually means metamorpho, which means to change to another form. He let them see him for who he really was. He let them see spirit upon him. So Matthew 17, 2, 2 to 3 is the passage in which Jesus takes Peter. He takes John up to the mountain and this metamorpho uh, before them. And Jesus' face shone like the sun is said. And it said he be, his clothing became dazzling white. Then Moses, Elijah uh, appear and talk with Jesus. So metaphysically interpreting John 17, two through three, reveals a tremendous spiritual revelation or transformation that occurs when one reaches in their awareness a higher 
level of consciousness subjectively and ascends to more of an elevated being. And that's what Jesus did. He did this subjectively. He, he, he let it become so personal that the people around him could see what was going on in his life. And so that's important. This dazzling white clothing symbolizes purity and spiritual clarity that's attained when we transcend limitations and illusions. Limitations and illusions of the material world. We have to stop saying, I can't. Donna can tell you our entire life, I never have liked her saying, I can't. I would say, please don't say that. I don't, you know, because I always worked in the sales field and people say, I can't do this, I can't do that. And guess what? If you believe you can't, yeah. you can't. <laughs> and also it becomes an excuse yeah. yes. not to do something. So the appearance of Moses and Elijah represents this incorporation of the law and the prophets are the reconciliation of the old and the new perceptions, thinking and being. This suggests that the metamorphal experience involves deepening our, our, our understanding. And it brings us into this perfect alignment with the divine mind. And that's what I'm seeking after constantly. I want to be so in line with my divine mind that every thought that I think is spiritual. Everything that comes out of my mouth is spiritual. And that wouldn't be boring. <laughs> I would love to sit around a spiritual person that's speaking spiritual things. And we, we could say Jesus raised his spiritual energy to take on a more spiritual form than just the physical. So literally, he glowed. Literally, if you could have seen him with your spirit eyes, he would have been probably beautiful color and glowing off from him, those things we've seen in movies. And because, like the shack. Have y'all seen the shack? Oh, you got to see it. I've heard it's really good. Yeah, it's on, it's on Facebook. It's so good. You know, it still has a little, Facebook? not Facebook, excuse Netflix. me, you, you, Netflix. It has a little bit of, you know, traditional teaching, but it's, it's got a lot of truth in it. Yeah. Okay. So Romans 9, 9. Abraham and Sarah received the promise to have their son Isaac by divine assurance. Isaac was a physical picture of Jesus and all mankind as the many-membered God-man. So in Hebrews, Isaac's name means he laughs or he will laugh or laughter, joy, singing, and leaping. So he speaks of divine sonship uh, Isaac meaning laughter signifies this pleasure of knowing that your conscience is spiritually renewed. The pleasure of knowing who you are. Your, your pleasure of this one, uh, this eternal relationship where we have a father. It brings me great pleasure to know all these things. Because there was a time that I never felt right. And I went to church all my life, but I never felt right. And because I couldn't do everything they told me to do. So... Apostle Paul was very familiar with these experiences because Jesus and the Essenes taught him of his divine mind and he shared the Logos with him. So where he rejoiced at being able to express himself as the Son of God then. And you can read that over and over. So according to the text, Isaac was born after Sarah was past the age of bringing forth a child. And of course, uh, Abraham was way too old to be able to produce a child physically. And so she was barren, not only in her body, but in her awareness. And there was no physical possibility of Isaac's conception under natural course. So we were born of spirit, not created. And Kay taught on that a lot in this teaching on what about those bodies. We're going to call it a different title, though. But we were born of spirit, not created, but of father. So our parents did not create us that 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 there is a physical way of having a child, but, but without that spark of light, without the spirit entering into that egg, there would be no child whatsoever. So I wasn't, my mom and dad did not create me. I was born of spirit. And that's how we have to understand that. When people say, when were you born? I would just say, I was born of spirit in 1950. And I and became visibility. Huh? You were slowed down. Well, the, that's what I mean. Yeah, in 1950, though, I came. When did your spirit slow down? I came. I I came out of my mom's. What I'm saying, out of my mom. So the new man is begotten by the divine spark entering into the parent mother, 
our, the, the logos, the creative spiritual activity. So a new state of consciousness that is formed and it fulfills the uh, admonition to let Christ be formed in you. That's what that really means. Let Christ, let spirit be formed in you. And then we find in Galatians 4.19, I'm almost done here. But the Apostle Paul writes, my little children for whom I, <coughs> excuse me, my little children for whom I'm again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. This verse is often interpreted spiritually to convey a deep understanding of this metamorpho that occurs within individuals. He's talking about being formed in, coming forth in, functioning in you. Too many people, the spirit is dormant in them, if you would. They are spirit, but it's dormant. So metaphysically, this verse can be understood as the process of inner growth and spiritual development, just as a child grows and develops within the womb until it's ready to be born. Paul uses this metaphor of childbirth to explain the intensity of his desire for spiritual growth to take place and that the Galatians would become spiritually mature. And mature is a, maturity is an important word in the body because people need to become mature. They, as long as you're always asking for something, pleading for something, trying to please God, trying to please your church, you're, you're immature. You're out there and not out of court. So the, the phrase, until Christ is formed in you, suggests that the ultimate goal is for the divine nature or Christ conscious to be fully realized and then expressed in you. You have to know, what is my consciousness? It's the, it's the Christ consciousness. It's the in contact with Father consciousness. And this, this, this gradually takes place. And then what happens is the first quality that begins the function, function is the fruit of the Spirit. And what is the fruit of the Spirit? Love. That's it. Everything else is the attribute of love. Without love, you can't be long-suffering. Without love, you can't be patient. Without love, you can't be kind. So it's not fruits of the Spirit. It says fruit singular. And so that's love. And then you have compassion and wisdom, Christ-like attributes, and they become dominant in your words and dominant in your actions. And nothing comes out of your mouth that's not, not produced by love. And that can be hard out here in this world. But literally, when you begin to allow the Spirit of God in you to conform you to that, your job gets easier, it gets more comfortable, you, it matters not what your boss says, you just do what you're supposed to do, and you go on and you keep being a blessing until either something happens or it's time to move on somewhere else. But you're there to bless them, they're not there to bless you. That's a pretty strong statement for a lot of people, but that's the truth. Galatians 4.19 reminds us that the spiritual growth is an ongoing process that requires nurturing, it requires patience, it requires perseverance, because there's a, there's a war going on inside of you, and that war is old thoughts, old beliefs, things that we haven't let go of yet. And so what do they need to do? They need to be washed with the water of the Logos and continue to allow that creative activity to be functioning in you and cleanse you from everything that's hindering you. So the depth of Paul's concern for the Galatians demonstrates his commitment to support their spiritual development. And I'm committed to do that for you. I want to support your spiritual development. I want to provide for you everything that you need, particularly you that are here. Every, any book that you want, uh, I have everything in PDF files, they're yours. You just tell me what you want. I got a library in there. You can go look at the books I have and say, I'd like to read that one. Some of them I'll say, no, you don't want that one because those are my old books. <laughs> but I have new ones that I can send to you. So I like the Apostle Paul and Jesus encourage people in their world. And I want to encourage them. I want them to embrace their more uh, metamorphal journey of becoming more aligned with spirit. And so that's where we need to metamorph, if we would. We need to change, not like I'm going to be a man or a woman or a different looking dude, you know, whatever, but I'm going to metamorph into spirit where people, when they look at me, they know they're in the presence of, of somebody that can help them and recognize that. I believe that's why that time that uh, I found one of my previous friends in Walmart that was drunk and I didn't know she was there, and I'm wanting to go somewhere and get something. 
and I know where the aisle is, but I kept hearing go down that aisle. And I fought it and I went past it. I kept hearing go down that aisle. And so I went back and went down there. She was weeping and said, I've been looking for you all day. And I hadn't seen her in years. Why would that be? Because she wasn't looking for Roy Richmond. She was looking for the presence of God. She needed somebody. And I imagine a lot of people passed her and went around her. Didn't even pay attention to her, right? So when Isaac was weaned, I'm closing with this. When Isaac was weaned, Ishmael, Hagar's son, mocked him. And remember who Ishmael was? Ishmael, Ishmael was the product of a good idea. Yeah. Right? Bad idea. A bad idea. In the church world, there's a lot of Ishmael's programs that are bad ideas. Ways of getting people to do things, bad ideas. So this is the experience of everyone in this new awareness birth. The thoughts that are, are the fruit of the mind of flesh rise up within and mock the new newness man, right? That here the overcomer has a work to do. Hagar, the bond maiden, and her son must be cast out. That's that mindset. Abraham grieves at this because he loved the, see it's, it's like ch church. You, you, got, you grieve over what you used to do. You grieve over your, what you've done. This is the way we've always done it. This is what we've always believed. Literally, when I was teaching more truth, people were grieving over the old and they, they wanted to go back to that. In fact, when we took a church of about 50 people and joined another church, when we came back, they didn't come back. They chased what they grieved for, the music, the fun, you know, signs and wonders and all that. So that's a real picture here. So we sometimes grieve over giving up the fruits that we have brought forth in the natural consciousness and that old worn out theology. And so Isaac was no, not noted for his achievements. He, he represented the serenity. He represented peace. He represented joy. That man has, when, when he accepts spiritual things as real, he lives, he's seeing himself who is the invisible. That's what happens when you let all that go. So we live in the invisible one. We live in the ageless one. And we are the visibility of Father in the earth. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yes. Amen? It's so good. Amen. It is good. Very good. All right. Thank you for being here, guys. I appreciate you. Several people are asking how my infusion went. I didn't have any ill effects whatsoever. I've had a few things happen this week, but nothing major. So... I'm very excited about that, and I'm believing this medicine's only going to do what it's supposed to do, and that's it. So that's how I ask that you believe. Hey, Karen Davidson, it's good to see you here. Love all of you. Bye-bye.